Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to the cooperative and open source uh, talk of Match Made in Heaven. My name is Watson. I'm one of the founders of the Volt Cooperative in Austin, Texas, as well as the Austin Software Cooperative uh, Meetup Group. As a, a cooperative that has contributed to open source, I'd like to share some of the synergies I found between uh, these two communities. So uh, today, well, we're going to explore uh, the concept of a cooperative and its motivations as well as the motivations for open source, uh, open source itself. <clears throat> we'll try to answer the question of whether a cooperative is a good business entity uh, for developing open source software. So what is a cooperative? The term cooperative covers a broad range of enterprises. There are cooperatives based on purchasing, selling, labor, and ownership. We're going to be concentrating on cooperatives that are worker-owned and worker-directed. In order to tease out the synergies between cooperatives and open source, we should investigate some uh, common motivators to these communities. Uh, borrowing from Daniel Pink's book, Drive, we could categorize the motivators as monetary, uh, autonomy, mastery, and uh, purpose. Uh, monetary is simply the acquisition of money or liquid assets. Uh, autonomy is the ability to choose one's own tasks and pathways. Uh, mastery is about craftsmanship or being a craftsman, or uh, I should say artisanship and being an artisan in one's field and purpose is about making a positive dent in the world. Feel free to uh, send any questions into the uh, chat. Uh, and then I'll stop and try to answer them. I'm going to try to go uh, pretty quick here. Um, <clears throat> there are several shared themes between open source and cooperatives. Both try to decentralize power, which is to say both try to flatten the intrinsic hierarchies, um, albeit using uh, different strategies. Both have unique and strong uh, views for their type of, of governance. Open source has a strong history of developing a community of contributors while trying to be inclusive of the community that is external to its contributors. Um, cooperatives have a history of develop, uh, developing an internal non-exploitative uh, culture of owners and then an external community that, uh, it use, that uses its services. Both open source and cooperative are concerned with fair compensation, but approach the problem in uh, different ways. And lastly, both uh, open source and cooperatives tend to consider ethical implications of the product, products and services uh, that they provide. <clears throat> Decentralization of uh, power. So the first shared theme uh, is decentralization. Uh, both uh, open source and cooperatives attempt to uh, decentralize power. The motivator uh, for this shared theme is a uh, drive for autonomy. Uh, decentralization is about distributing the work that is done to a wide base. For open source, decentralization can be uh, facilitated by decentralizing leadership structures, uh, but sometimes this isn't the case. Uh, the biggest driver for decentralization in an open source project is the organic development of a diverse contributor base. Any open source project can be forked, which incentivizes the original uh, project's leadership to uh, be uh, more liberal in accepting the best ideas as contributions. Um, so for um, cooperatives, uh, decentralization comes um, in the form of a worker owned, um, of the worker owned aspect of the uh, entity. The, the steering power and uh, direction in a cooperative is dispersed through the group via the one worker, um, one vote principle. 
each worker has much more say uh, in uh, what they are working on compared to a traditional entity because they're an owner in the cooperative. Uh, democratic, let's see here. So democratic and governance or democratic uh, governance. Uh, <clears throat> again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to post them and I'll take a look at them. Um, democratic governance is another shared theme uh, between open source and cooperatives. Uh, it is again motivated by the desire for autonomy. Uh, while decentralization spreads the actual tasks uh, into a wider uh, area, um, governance is about uh, deciding which tasks should be uh, prioritized. While decentralization in open source is attractive uh, because community members can avoid coordination with a hierarchy when performing individual tasks, uh, democratic governance is what provides a method for influencing the overall project. Jonah Bacon in The Art of Community states that there are three types of governance uh, stru um, structures within uh, open source, the benevolent dictator, the enlightened dictatorship, and delegated uh, governance. Now, enlightened dictatorship is based on the idea that people gain influence uh, with it, uh, by becoming thought leaders and through doing useful uh, work, whereas uh, um, delegated governance uh, has um, power delegated to small groups and those small groups come together to form a single governing body. So these latter two uh, forms of, of governance uh, share the same spirit of uh, worker participation in governance to a great degree with uh, cooperatives. And so that's where they uh, are similar. So within um, worker-owned cooperatives <coughs> uh, that have a, a one worker, one uh, vote mandate, the workers can legally vote the leadership into their roles. Uh, in worker-owned, worker-directed cooperatives, the workers decide where to invest or spend the surplus uh, or profit democratically. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, in all forms of uh, cooperatives, the workers have a high degree of participation in how they are governed, but the most democratic type of cooperative is the worker-owned uh, and worker-directed cooperative. So I think we have a couple of questions here. I'm gonna go ahead and try to take a look at some of these. Uh, Let's see here, I'm gonna go ahead and see if we'll try this. To show this question. All right, so David Klein, I love this concept. Thank you for presenting. I have, uh, have you spent any time thinking about a buyer's co-op model and how would you, uh, how would it work with open source? So uh, a buyer's co-op where people are coming together in order to purchase. I think that's a purchasing co-op. So I'm not so sure. Maybe a little clarification there. And I don't know how that would maybe work. Um, I'm sorry, with open source. Uh, but a buyer co-op or purchasing co-op where um, you come together and purchase um, health insurance or something like that, those are pretty common and they seem to be a good idea uh, with all of these examples or, or um, there's plenty of examples within uh, for cooperatives of the, just about anything that you can imagine uh, but in spiral is uh, one of my favorites and they're they're basically a cooperative of cooperatives um, you might want to look at them as far as probably seeing um, if they have something that might be a purchasing cooperative. And uh, we're going to go ahead and answer another question here. So we got uh, Taylor Carpenter. Are there any examples of open source projects using delegated governance? So 
the example that General uh, Bacon uses for delegated governance, um, I want to say, well, there's Apache maybe and um, the CNCF, the Cloud Native uh, Foundation would be one, right? So small groups coming together to form a single unifying body. The higher end or the upper end is kind of more strategic than, but, and they, they, they don't get into the individual, like the operational day-to-day -day, uh, decisions. Uh, those are left to the individual groups. Um, so that's kind of where the delegated governance comes through. And then I, I want to say General uh, Bacon, who's, I want to say he, he spoke earlier uh, today, uh, he favors the delegated governance style. Let's see here. We're going to take a question from Angie. This talk is more interesting than uh, than I thought. <laughs> Can you provide a real world example and mention a case study? So, um, I'm going to mention a case study at the at the end. So, um, it's going to be a good one. So, let's see who else. Okay, that's good. All right. Let's go on to uh, talk about communities. All right. Okay, so both uh, open source and uh, cooperatives are deeply intertwined uh, with their communities. A big motivation for open source um, contributors is the development and showcasing of the mastery of one's craft. Uh, this gives social capital to the individual contributor within the context of a community. For many uh, cooperatives, building the community is the uh, business strategy, which leans towards the greater purpose as the motivation. Um, going back to the different styles or uh, categories of motivation. Um, for these cooperatives where purpose is their motivation, a feedback uh, loop in the form of serving the immediate local community uh, with their products uh, and services is the, it ends up being the best way to attract new members to develop those uh, projects, uh, products and services. So ends up being uh, kind of a bootstrapping Right. So the, where the business, the community is the business strategy on um, that. So um, it's a, uh, kind of interesting. You might, again, try to take a look at um, Inspiral for a good example of that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, compensation. Let's see here. Um, so monetary compensation is the um, traditional way uh, to think of motivation for economists and, and uh, the general public. Um, both open source and cooperatives uh, have a non-traditional uh, or conventional approach to um, compensation. Uh, and, and as mentioned before, uh, open source is uh, largely driven by social capital but that social capital can indirectly have monetary uh, gain in the form of uh, building a strong signal uh, for competence in one's craft. So uh, this serves as a kind of ideal resume for the contributors uh, to an open source project. Uh, cooperatives can sell products and services as a normal uh, business would at the group level right? So at the higher level, but at the individual level, the compensation schemes can be similar to those that you would find in a business that runs as a partnership. And this is a kind of really important to understand about a, a cooperative. You really, to understand when people are confused about a cooperative, I always just say, think about a, a law firm. They, they run as partnerships. And it's always, it's interesting that the people that understand law, they opt to 
form an entity that's a partnership. Whereas people that don't understand law and fairness and things like that, they don't, they, they're um, happy to just consent to uh, a, a hierarchy and a, a, a corporate structure. So I find that to be tremendously um, interesting. Right, so within a, um, a cooperative, some way of uh, working out a fair compensation uh, must occur in an, an entity that has uh, one member and one vote. So it kind of serves as a, um, as kind of like a, 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 a barrier to stop unfair, unfairness, uh, inequitabilities and things like that. So for instance, um, Co um, corporations, the typical corporations have a, a ratio of um, executive to worker compensation that's like 278 to one. Whereas a partnership style, so uh, cooperatives are everyone's an owner, so they're kind of like a, a partnership style. Those operate anywhere between four, between four and 10. To one. So just that alone kind of gives more of a, a equitable um, compensation scheme without even getting too advanced. Um, so uh, that there's plenty of there's lots of information on uh, compensation schemes, and I just really that's one of my favorite uh, topics when it comes to. Um, cooperatives and fairness and things like that. We um, And I'm going to have a bunch of links later um, where you can see more papers and stuff on that. So now we're getting to um, ethics. So um, within both open source and cooperatives, uh, the ethics have to in my opinion, they have to do uh, with, you can kind of categorize them as uh, mitigation of exploitation. And <clears throat> exploitation is an interesting subject to try to have people define. Um, on one extreme, you could say something along the lines of exploitation is um, stealing or something like that, something illegal. Whereas on the other extreme, um, what you'll find is people say, uh, they'll, they'll kind of lean on consent and say, um, if you consented, there's no way that you got exploited. So even indentured servitude, which is consent, people used to be able to say, or people used to, um, which is illegal now, be able to say within feudalism and so on and so forth, I will uh, commit myself to you, pledge myself to you for five years and, you know, essentially be your slave. <clears throat> and um, that's consent, but yet, um, you know, it's to, to me, that's an exploitation. Uh, so if you were to um, talk about exploitation, what I think the, a good definition to try to do a middle road is uh, exploitation happens when someone creates a product or service, but doesn't have any say in the surplus or profit of that product or service. So to make it simple, an example would be if you had, um, if you made, a, if you contributed to making a widget and let's just say your wages and everyone else's wages to create a widget was six dollars, and the widget was sold for for ten dollars. That four dollars, that's the profit that that it was sold for. That four dollars is the surplus, right? If you don't have any say on that surplus, then you, that's a exploit. That's a definition of exploitation. That's one definition. But I would challenge. It's really important to think about a reason about um, what exploitation is, and if if you don't use that uh, definition, uh, right? so I find it to be ambiguous.
oftentimes. All right, so <clears throat> um, so talking about some of how uh, some of the uh, ways that open source tries to address exploitation, uh, I actually think open source mitigates exploitation because it's licensing ensures that the, the code is a non-rival good, right? A non-rival good really means just that no one is excluded uh, when the good is consumed, right? So you, you use open source simply, and um, it is, uh, obviously it doesn't stop someone else from using it, right? And um, that it's a small mitigation of, of exploitation, um, as far as the contributors, so, so if you're a contributor open source and you, um, you want to use, let's, you're a contributor to some software and you want to use that software, if it's open source, let's just say it's a dual licensing situation or whatever, um, you, can, you can go and at least use it in another um, scenario and um, say that you worked on it and so on and so forth and, and actually use it and um, it, it ends up working whereas um, like say a closed source you, it you get uh, exploited in some way so uh, as far as cooperatives the cooperatives are kind of built for dealing with um, exploitation they mitigate exploitation because the workers actually literally vote on how the surplus is used Right. So all the owners get together and say, oh, we sold the, the widget for ten dollars. It's a four dollar profit. We're going to say we're going to reinvest in the company or we're going to give everyone a raise, whatever. Right. So that's kind of kind of the argument there. So. All right. So some final thoughts. Right. Um, open source emerged originally from the desire to share ideas among early computer scientists and uh, practitioners, uh, but it did not inherently uh, address exploitation of its contributors. Right? Um, we have kind of a bunch of different um, situations, dual licensing, open core, things like that where the contributors, um, they don't get a say on where the surplus goes. Cooperatives emerged directly from the desire to address uh, exploitation, but it didn't inherently share the recipes of any innovation that were um, developed by the non-members, right? So um, cooperatives kind of aren't really nice when considering the external world inherently, right? So while cooperatives and open source projects emerge to solve different problems, there's no reason to avoid the combination of these two structures. Uh, and uh, to address what we were saying earlier, uh, this has been done in uh, traditional ways uh, Volk, the company that I'm a part of, we actually develop open source software. So that's one example. But a new form of cooperative called a platform cooperative exists where software, infrastru software infrastructure is developed uh, and shared among the members of the cooperative. And then they provide services on top of that shared infrastructure. So it's open source. So anyone can use it but the services are actually uh, the, the part that's sold. And uh, so uh, let's see some examples of that. I wanna say there's a company in Denver where they, um, it's called the Green Taxi Cooperative and they're a platform cooperative. They develop software that's essentially similar to Uber, but it's open source. And I guess anyone can develop or download, develop, and create their own uh, uh, cooperative, uh, taxi cooperative. Uh, but the Green Taxi Cooperative actually uses it, and then they sell the services, and all, so on and so forth. Uh, so that would be a platform cooperative. 
So uh, uh, to answer, uh, I think it was Angie's question. So to combine the combination in, in, in summary, the combination of decentralization, uh, democratic governance, value of community, alternative compensation schemes, and ethical priorities provides a unique position on how we could organize employment and goods together, right? So cooperatives are really good at employment and exploitation dealing with that. And open source is really sensitive to how the goods are distributed. If you put those two together, it seems to be, in my opinion, a match made in heaven. Um, any questions? Uh, I think we've got uh, three minutes or something like that. I see a couple here. Can you talk about the similarities between, let me publish this question. Can you talk about the similarities between differences between partnerships and worker cooperatives? So worker cooperatives really have uh, two tiers. You have members and you have associates. Partnerships within um, law firms, they can have two tiers, they can have three tiers. You really don't find them where they have more than three tiers. Um, that would be a major difference um, or a slight difference actually. Um, so, you know, a common misconception within, uh, in my opinion, within cooperatives is that there, um, there, there's zero hierarchy, you're a communist and, or an anarchist or something like that. No, there can be, you know, if someone, if you're in a situation where it's a kind of eat what you kill, someone brings on a project, you, there's a hierarchy there, right? It's not completely flat. Right. There's, you know, someone brings in, if you're a law firm, you bring in the big $2 million project, then, um, you know, and, and let's just say that that law firm only makes, you know, a million dollars a year and someone brings in a $2 million project. They, they, that person that brings it in gets to do, gets to do what they want and they get to bring in who they want and work on what they want and they make it equitable. Um, you know, um, so, there's a certain amount of fairness that comes in there. Um, so there's some kind of um, hierarchy there. Uh, and then I want to say that a cooperative that runs as a service and a, um, a services oriented type firm, consultancy, that type, they end up having those types of situations, um, which I think is fair. You know, there's a difference between equitability which is everyone's the same and um, I'm sorry, egalitarianism and where everyone's the same and equitability where it's um, someone brings in uh, work and they kind of, they kind of, um, they're, they're able to, since they took the risk and they did the, the front loading of getting this work, the marketing and all that sales, they get um, to decide who they bring on and, and they get to have some, uh, more decisions, uh, more power in the decisions. So it's more, it's a flat hierarchy, it's a flatter hierarchy, but it's not completely flat. Uh, let's see here, let's publish this. Save this, okay. Sometimes flat structures can still contribute to inequality, just more quietly, think valve. Have you seen this in practice? Okay, I kind of tried to address that. So. Um, there's a difference between egalitarian and equitability, right? And so it, it depends on what I, I want to think that you're saying with inequality, someone contributed a whole lot and maybe you don't mean this, but someone contributed a whole lot and, but then they got compensated just the same as everyone else. Um, Equitability is a different, and this is a whole different um, uh, discussion, but it's called, if you're interested, it's called fair division. 
within game theory, and it's also called uh, fair division within law, uh, within state planning and things like that. Um, that's probably where you want to look if you want to um, see some of the answers for this. But yeah, flatness, just everyone being equal is the same. Okay, let's a follow up, meaning some ideas were valued less than others in conversation, even though everyone is equal. Okay, so I mean, yeah, I do see that that can happen. Um, it'd be interesting. I mean, it's it seems like that's not necessarily a, a function of cooperatives, though. That seems like to be a social problem, uh, in, in my opinion, though. That that's an interesting question, though. Let's do this. Uh, it's five oh two, so I think we're going over. Um. If you all want to uh, ask me some of these questions, uh, join the do a Google search on the or let me show some of these uh, papers. And um, you can go ahead and visit the Austin Software Cooperative. Uh, Google Austin Software Cooperatives and uh, join that meetup group and send me these questions directly. And I can probably answer those questions at that point. Um, and uh, thanks for joining.